Okay, it's another great episode, people. I love this episode. Alan Zhang, who is literally a full professor at 10 years. Sorry, Bill Levine. I think he got there before you. Uh, University of California, San Francisco. He is one of these unique sports medicine docs that operates on all the large volume joints. So he does hip arthroscopy, shoulder, as well as knee as well. He's incredibly um, uh, well thought of across the international community as well. Uh, he's a mentor. He does amazing research. Uh, he does a great job with social media. So this is a great episode for all of those younger orthopedic surgeons that are out there that are thinking about a pathway into this. I know you're going to like it. It's another great episode. Dr. Sigmin, hashtag follow the fro. From Medical Media, this is The Author Show. Hello world, Dr. Scott Sigmund, your favorite opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon here for another episode of the Ortho Show podcast, where everyone knows we bring you the best of the best in orthopedics. Our mission is to democratize orthopedics, make it available for anyone that wants to listen and understand. And we share the remarkable stories of some of the most amazing people in orthopedics. And today is no exception. We have Dr. Alan Zhang. This is going to take me a while, Alan. I got to get through all of your titles. So give me a second here. So professor in residence. We're going to have to, you'll have to explain that to us. Director of the Hip Preservation Center, Medical Director of UCSF Orthopedic Institute, the Director of the Sports Medicine and Shoulder Fellowship of the University of California, San Francisco Medical School, the consummate underachiever, Dr. Zhang. How are you, brother? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Thanks so much for having me, Scott. And yes, I've got a, a lot of flares on my vest, so happy to go through some of those things, but... Uh, it's been uh, busy here uh, keeping up with all the work, but happy to uh, help as much as I can with uh, with our initiatives. Oh, you're awesome. You know, you're like part of this new breed, you know, the Rachel Franks, the Seth Shermans of the world that they're only in their orthopedic, you know, life, maybe 10 years, but yet, you know, are sought after for all of the things and great things that you do. So here's what we do. We start off, always like to start the show off with with where it all started for you. I know that you you're, you speak Cantonese and Mandarin. So where were you born? What were your parents doing? Who was the first doctor? We love hearing all that stuff. Sure, sure. So, yeah, my family's uh, originally from uh, China. So uh, we uh, moved here when I was uh, a very uh, at a very young age, and then we moved right to uh, Houston, Texas. So essentially, I grew up in in Houston. That's my hometown, uh, and I went to all of my school from you know elementary school through middle school, high school. All, all in the heart of Texas in Houston. Uh, and then when I went to college, I ended up staying uh, locally in Houston at Rice University. And it was actually just like 15 uh, minutes away from where my house was at the time. Uh, so essentially, I, I grew up and stayed in Houston uh, all the way through the, the end of college. So is, it, is this the classic Chinese immigrant story of your parents looked at you at the age of like six months and said, you have a choice, you can be a doctor? Uh, pretty, yeah, no, pretty much. <laughs> That's pretty much exactly how it went. <laughs> it's all right. We can fess up because you're not, you know, we, we, we're, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of that, those, those stories that are very common in uh, our parents wanting us to succeed and be more successful than them. And certainly being a physician is a way to create uh, that professional success for sure. Uh, so yeah, so you stayed in Houston and uh, Rice, you were, you were geeking it out at Rice here, Alan. I'm going to call you out on this, okay? You're summa cum laude in a double major of biochem and cell biology. What was the story with that? Yeah, so um, uh, so at Rice, I wasn't uh, entirely sure I was going to be pre med, and just joking aside, my patient, uh, my parents were both. Um, uh, academics. They both did um, like uh, research. So my mom was like a PhD in biochemistry and my dad was a statistician. Uh, so they just, you know, uh, because of that, I just naturally gravitated towards the scientific field. So they never uh, told me they wanted me to be a doctor or anything, but it's just kind of a, a natural uh, kind of inclination towards the sciences. So when I went into college, uh, I studied uh, uh, biochemistry and then also uh, uh, some of the more uh, cellular biology uh, stuff that I did was more along with the research. And then you can kind of double major in both of those disciplines and do some kind of like uh, senior thesis work to get the double major. So I kind of did that. 
But then as I was going through my uh, undergrad studies, I became really interested in kind of the clinical care aspect of uh, some of these bench work research that translated to uh, eventually uh, clinical like medicine and uh, even like surgical treatments um, <clears throat> based on some of the things we're finding in the lab. Uh, so that's what gravitated me towards the, the medical field. And I decided to go into med school uh, when I was essentially when I was my junior year of college is when I made that decision. So you graduated from the microscope in those cells and then decided we're going to look at the entire body experience, which I think is terrific because that, you know, you take that sort of a background that that uh, cellular biology, uh, the scientific background, and then figure out a way to apply that, you know, to the entire human being uh, and then really, you know, provide science to the things that we do in orthopedics, which has never been our strong point, right? Most of the things we do in orthopedics, we've tried two or three times, it fails, and then we try it again the same way and expect a different result. But, you know, so it's nice to have a fresh look into the process. So your junior year, you finally figured it out, okay, we're going to go to medical school. We're going to talk to people for a living. And um, and so so orthopedics was that where did that vision come from? Yeah. So that didn't come in until much later. So uh, when I was uh, looking at uh, med schools, like my top my final two choices were either to stay in Texas and go to Baylor College of Medicine right across the street from Rice or come out to California and go to uh, UC San Diego for med school. And it was really kind of like an uh, 11th hour decision. And I, at that point, I, you know, 20, what, 21, 22 years old, I said, it's time to, you know, leave home yeah, and get a little farther away from my parents and 15 minutes away. So then uh, that's when I kind of uh, branched out and uh, decided to go to med school in California. And then, uh, and that was probably one of the best decisions I ever made because just, you know, being completely uh, finally separate from the family, like you can go home on Sunday nights to do your laundry if you needed to. Uh, at that point, I was actually uh, fully independent, so to speak, uh, in med school. And that really allowed me to kind of discover myself and discover some of my interests. Uh, and then through that, I did a lot of various research programs based on my previous experiences. And I, I got in a lab um, during the summer of after my first year of med school in an orthopedic uh, biomechanics lab, uh, looking at uh, various pullout um, uh, mechanics for the ACL graphs. And that's what really sparked my interest in orthopedics. Yeah. Wonderful. So basically, not that there's anything wrong with Houston, uh, but, you know, you land in San Diego and then which is obviously one of the best places on the planet for anyone that wants to live of temperatures of 70 degrees, right? Even the bug, even the bugs don't live in San Diego. There's no bugs. I mean, it's like it is one of the most beautiful places on the planet. So you figure it out that, OK, California's got a lot going on. And I'm looking at your CV here. You never left California again, uh, but we could talk about that. So, all right. So, so it's interesting again, though, it's the science side of things that sort of got you into orthopedics because you're in this biomechanics lab, you're using that scientific brain of yours to sort of, you know, continue with research. Uh, and then orthopedics comes in into play. And then you decide it's going to be UCLA for an orthopedic residency. You're like, Okay, I'm I'm staying in California. I'll only go 100 miles away from where I went to medical school. So you get to do either UCLA or USC were your only choices, and UCLA <laughs> was. So tell us about your residency at UCLA. Yeah, so I had a great time at UCLA. That was my top choice for residency, and I was the happiest day of my life when I when I uh, matched there. Um, I really uh, knew a lot about the program from other uh, friends and colleagues that had gone through it. And I just really liked their philo philosophy for teaching. So uh, I had a great five years there uh, learning. Um, I had a great experience with sports medicine. So at UCLA, shout outs, give us the shout outs. We want right. to know who they are. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're sports medicine specialists here, and we definitely love our field. Definitely from all the things we, we've done together, we can see that. Uh, but uh, as a resident at UCLA, you do a sports rotation as a R2, as a R4, and as an R5. R5. And then you also do sports on other rotations like the VA and whatnot. So we really have a really strong background in sports, and that really uh, fueled my interest to, to go into that as a subspecialty. Yeah. So you have a great residency at UCLA and you're decided, you know, you're just going to keep driving down Route 1 North and you're going to head your way up, you know, uh, to, to San Francisco next and you're going to stay in California and then you do your fellowship where you currently are on faculty. So again, you know, uh, give the shout outs because, you know, it's funny when I do when we do our research here, Alan, I always really try to take a deep dive and it's like, 
what an impressive department at UCSF. I mean, I really didn't quite understand. I and mean, we've had some of your colleagues, Sarah Edwards, Stefan Abini, uh, Nick Nick is coming on board too. We're going to get him in his Great. F2 car and be able to drive around and tell us about his meniscal repairs, which I love. Perfect. But I mean, you guys do have a really great department. So so where was the draw for the sports medicine fellowship and then being able to stay yeah. on staff? It's such a it's not easy to stay on staff at, at, at these major hospitals in, in California. Yeah. So I, I was also super ecstatic when I uh, matched at UCSF for my fellowship. That was also my top choice. And back then it was still like a smaller fellowship because they only took one fellow a year. Uh, and back then, my I, I had three like full time attendings. It was uh, Ben Ma, who was the chief, and then Christina Allen, uh, and then Brian Feely. So it was me working with three of them. And what really drew me to the fellowship was that they did a, a lot of high volume, complex sports cases like revision ACLs, complex shoulders, and they also did uh, open shoulder surgeries, like a lot of shoulder arthroplasty as, as well. Which at that time I was very interested in. The one thing this program didn't do a lot of was hip arthroscopy. And when I was going, uh, looking for fellowships, I wasn't that interested in it. Back then in 2013, 2012, 2018, hip arthroscopy is not as popular as it is now. It's still growing, but back then it wasn't like a, uh, like a, a primary objective to seek out that training. Um, so, uh, at that time I, I went ahead and, uh, did the, tr my training with the, uh, with the, the three of them here. Uh, and then at the end of uh, my fellowship, uh, or towards the end, they, they were looking to hire on, um, a new faculty member uh, and they uh, had, uh, apparently they liked me that year after having worked with me as well as so I could help promote the clinical, uh, research, uh, for, for the, uh, division. But the one caveat was, hey, we want to hire you, but we need somebody to do hip arthroscopy. Uh, and of course, that's the one thing that during my fellowship, I didn't do a lot of. So uh, gladly, I, I said, oh, gladly, I, I can I can learn that. <laughs> uh, and definitely not not as easy as you would have thought. So so I spent a lot of time in my early career seeking out additional training, doing courses, uh, doing observerships, uh, doing a lot of labs to just make sure um, I was comfortable with the surgery. And then uh, being uh, like a really busy department uh, and not having somebody specialized in that pretty much right when I started practice, uh, my clinics uh, were filled with like patients with hip injury. So uh, I got to uh, uh, hit the ground running and kind of sink or sh swim type of deal. Uh, and my practice really got busy with it. And once you're, you're busy doing something, it, it becomes a, a lot more natural, of course. Yeah, no, your story is very common to Mike Gerhardt. I know you know Mike well too, who's on the other side, on the south side of uh, of California, still down at Cedar Sinai now. And it was the same thing. He had an opportunity to join Smog in Santa Monica, but they were like, "We need you to learn, you know, how to do, you know, hip arthroscopy." And he took that time, did exactly what you did, did some internships and, and externships and observing and all that that went with it. And so, you know, you're part of that rare breed where, you know, you're doing all the large volume joints, you know, with, with arthroscopic intervention. That's very rare. I mean, we got a lot of people that do knee and shoulder. Then we've got a lot of people that just do shoulder. Then we've got a bunch of hip preservationists. And then we've got Alan, who's like, I'm going to scope your hip. I'm going to scope your shoulder. I'm going to scope your knee. And I can do it all. Uh, and that's wonderful. And now, you know, you're in practice for 10 years and all of your fellows and residents are learning about hip arthroscopy through the through the time you've had. And, you know, I, I'm laughing when you said, but, you know, when I got back and I started and I opened up my shingle and did my, and all these hip patients kept coming. I'm like, there's a lot of Meshuggah hip patients out there. And as you know, oh. the number one reason to have a good outcome from hip arthroscopy is your indications, right? You yes. have to have the appropriate indications. Absolutely. I agree that 100%. Yes. Yeah, so for sure. All right. So, and so then it was sort of, it seems like academics was just the way you were going to go. I mean, it didn't seem like there was an opportunity or a thought for you in private practice. And obviously, you know, you're absolutely crushing it in that world. You're 10 years in and you've worked your work. What is this professor in residence? I could not figure that out. We'll explain sure. that to us, please. Yeah. So uh, for uh, UCSF, and I think all of the University of California systems are, are similar, there's different tracks when you're a faculty member. So uh, there is like a health science uh, professorship, which is kind of like you're uh, doing a pretty much mostly clinical work and not much like academic work. So you're not really expected to do much teaching or research. So you're basically just on the clinical track where you're practicing as if you're in um, uh, private practice. Um, and there's not a lot of other expectations for that. 
And then you've got the next one for us, it's called the clinical science track. So then those titles would be like clinical professor of orthopedics or clinical associate prep professor. So then that's where you're kind of half and half where you uh, are expected to do a lot a lot of clinical work and drive clinical uh, volume, uh, but you also do uh, teach as well. And you also do research. There's just like a, maybe a little lower bar for promotion uh, on that ladder uh, to kind of track. And then the in-residence track is uh, kind of like, almost like the tenure track. We don't have a tenure track anymore at UC. So, uh, but the in-residence is like the uh, full academic track where you have pretty rigorous standards of advancing based on your uh, teaching, your evaluations, your research, your publications, grants, all of those things. So the more uh, purely academic uh, positions are going to be like the uh, in-residence pathway. Yeah. All right. So we're going to have to, you know, Grace and I are going to have to go back and, and look at the footage on this one. But 10 years in, you're basically a full professor, correct? Professor yeah. in residence, but you are a full professor. So we're going to go back. I know Bill's, Bill Levine's listening, who is, you know, one of our dear friends. I, I think you may have just beaten Bill by a year, but we're going to have to go back and check the bean footage on that one. So I'm sure Bill will be texting me as soon as this comes out to let me know for, for sure. All right. So it's academics the whole way for you. And you really excelled at it. And one of the biggest parts of, of being in academics is the ability to educate and to share. Right. And I think that uh, your spirit of education is palpable. Uh, you you care you know tremendously about your fellows and your residents and the medical students. And one of the things that stuck out to the most for me on your CV was you you actually list your mentees on your CV of the people that you have helped along in their way, and that's tremendous. So where did that come from? Was that something that you had learned from someone else? Where where did this this desire to pass on your knowledge come from? Yeah, so I think that kind of started uh, when I was a, a, a fellow here, having been the only fellow at that time. Now our fellowship has three fellows a year, uh, but having been the only fellow with three three attendings, it was really kind of like a mentorship model during my fellowship where I spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with each of our attendings uh, and really got to know them. And they, they helped me a lot in terms of uh, helping me hone in my surgical skills, my academic pathway, talking about my future goals and aspirations. And I, I just found that kind of uh, mentorship during my fellowship to be so, so uh, valuable for, for my career. And that's really where I got the head start into, like, uh, as we talk about, like advancing through the career pathway, going from assistant to associate professor to, to now a full professor just uh, uh, a month ago. Uh, so we kind of got on the show right right after. Uh, Mazel tov. We love it. With, that's what we do at the Ortho Show. We create these things for you. So you have the ability to share it with everyone. Your mother and dad, your mother and father are so proud of you for sure. Yeah. Perfect. So yeah, so for my uh, fellowship is where I kind of learned the value of good mentorship for the next generation of surgeons. So we really take our time, even now our, uh, that our program has grown a lot, to uh, make sure we provide that mentorship for all of our fellows and all of our residents who are interested in sports and who are seeking that mentorship for us, from us. Yeah. That's It's really wonderful and commend you completely. That's one of our favorite words on the Ortho Show is mentor. Uh, as we talk to so many amazing orthopedic surgeons who have shared uh, the things that they've learned. And you still obviously have so much yet to learn in your experience of your practice Absolutely. as well. And I'm sure you still have your mentors that you keep in touch with. And as we all do, even for, for me as well in my clinical practice. The other thing that you're crushing, <laughs> crushing is research. So I'm on the social media board for the Journal of Arthroscopy. So I, I have the responsibility of a bunch of times during the year posting the articles that come through the Journal of Arthroscopy. And, and like, dude, I'm like, I post like one of your articles like every week. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, Thank you. it's like, it's like, we have to do, you know, me and Kyle Coons, who's, uh, who's the chief resident at HSS and big shout out to Kyle. He's uh, doing awesome. He's do, getting ready to do a sports medicine fellowship. So we got to tell him he wants to go to rush. So we got to talk to Brian Cole and Jorge and Nick and make sure that we get him a spot there. But he and I, every week get together, we do these things every five weeks and I'm like, okay, there's another zag. Let's get it out there. You know, oh, it's right. uh, really <laughs> impressive. So, so the drive for research becomes part of academics, but it's also part of the teaching process as well, right? Working one-on-one yeah. -on -one with your fellows and hopefully there's some medical students that jump on early for their career as well. 
Yes. Yeah. So especially in the summertime, like right now, we have a lot of summer medical students, just like when I did my first ortho project between first and second year of med school, there's a, a great opportunity for med students to get involved. So right now I'm, I'm working with three different med students this summer on three different projects. Uh, and those are uh, 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 very interesting projects because the med students, uh, sometimes they have a very different way of looking at things that, you know, we look at certain things, uh, uh, things a certain way from our clinical experience. And then they'll come in and they'll ask, like, why do you do it that way? Well, it's because, oh, oh actually, I'm not sure why. Let's look into that. <laughs> uh, so some there, there's some great projects and great ideas that come out of these relationships that we do love working with med students on research uh, and introducing them to the field that way. And that interesting sort of a cross pollinization, right? You get that generation that looks at things very differently than we do. And then all of a sudden, maybe you can open your eyes up and see and try and, and question what we're doing as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's great. I think whether it's medical students or if you're in college or whether but or not, but identifying, you know, doctors that are willing to do this early on in your career is a great way for our young listeners that are out there to try and develop a career in orthopedics. It's a challenge. It's hard, right? There's a lot of smart people out there. So I think that in my day, you know, you, you didn't really need the research, but these days you really do. It's a real big, important part of your of your CV and what you're building as your as your portfolio as you get going. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, you and I do a lot of the same stuff. We've done a lot of uh, cool work together with uh, professional education and, and for industry sponsorship as well. But let's talk about hip preserve. That's like the new word. It's like, it's not just hip scopes. You know, I'm a hip preservationist. So what does that mean to you? And explain that to our audience if they're trying to identify a way so that they don't get metal in their hip if there's any way. Yeah, yeah. I think um, what we've kind of grown the field to be is uh, hip preservation for one, because um, a lot of the degenerative changes we see in the hip are irreversible. There's not a lot of good treatments for cartilage injury. So, you know, in the knee, we've got our cartilage uh, transplants, our uh, matrices and, and, and whatnot. Uh, and in the shoulder, we, we, we're, uh, we, we're getting better with some of our reconstructive techniques that may hopefully prevent cuthrate arthropathy, like the patches and the um, uh, reconstructions and, and whatnot. But in the hip, there's really not a lot of good treatments once you start to get head, uh, head down this degenerative pathway. Um, uh, there's not a lot of things you can do to reverse it. So we kind of uh, 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 hone in on the concept of preserving your hip, things that you can do to make sure you don't get degenerative changes. Uh, for one, for one thing that we treat a lot of with hip arthroscopy surgery is hip impingement. So with FAI femoral acetabular impingement, we know that that has a high risk factor of causing early degeneration. Um, so one of the things we're trying to research actively is whether when we do these treatments for our athletes, um, early rather earlier rather than later for uh, getting rid of the impingement, repairing any tears in like the labrum, uh, if that is actually a hip preserving surgery uh, down the line. So there's some early evidence looking at that, um, uh, showing it to be promising, but we don't have like 50 year data on hip arthroscopy surgeries to to be able to uh, report that current. You know, I, I, I tell this story just about every time I get a hip preservation. So Joe McCarthy and I in 1995 at the New England Baptist Hospital in Boston were scoping hips. And it was just like, dude, we got in. You know, uh -huh. We weren't really sure what we were going to do once we got in there because barely we could get the shaver and the camera in. But, you know, it's amazing what you guys are doing now. And for our listeners, you know, femoral acetabular impingement, just think about sort of like the, the ball and socket are banging into each other. And so there's ways now where you can remove those sort of bone spurs that allows the hip to move better. You can repair the car, some of the ligaments around the hip area as well, all done minimally invasive with arthroscopic techniques that really are evolving tremendously. And I think that, you know, I look at shoulder where we are now and the things that we're doing, I think another 10 years and we'll be crazy doing good stuff in the hip joint as well. So let's talk a little bit again about one of my favorite subjects and you do it really well and you have a unique perspective on it and that's social media. So, you know, for a professor at an academic institution to, to spend the time and the energy to put out entertaining social media to educate, you know, and to share the unique stories is wonderful. And you do a great job. And I really enjoy watching you. But I'm a little perplexed because you are like an Instagram wizard. 
But yet, I can't find you on LinkedIn. We all live on LinkedIn. Where's Alan? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm got to get Alan on LinkedIn. What's the deal, man? Talk to me. Yeah, so, I mean, Instagram, I mean, you know, for my generation, I think it's not that hard to uh, get used to using it. We're all on our mobile device devices pretty easily and uh, and it's pretty intuitive now I'm not that good at some of the younger guys because just even last week uh, one of uh, our, our younger attendings was showing me how to like minimize text and shrink it I had no idea I was like how do you make it smaller like oh just squish it with your fingers I was like squish oh. it come on Alan squish it <laughs> um, so yeah I'm still learning myself but just uh, intuitively Instagram is just like an easy platform that you know even uh, uh, earlier on my friends and I were using just for like personal things and so it was natural to transition to like a more uh, to have a professional account to really kind of put out some of our uh, some of our cases for education for other surgeons. Also, it's been great for networking. I've had people uh, uh, surgeons from all over the world, like uh, from Japan, just uh, communicate with me through uh, social media to talk about cases and uh, and approaches and methods. Uh, so I've really enjoyed um, uh, uh, doing that part and, and growing that part of um, part of my, I guess, practice, so to speak, is just kind of uh, networking and, and educating through that. Uh, LinkedIn, though. So now LinkedIn, I never really got into LinkedIn because from what I knew, it's it's what you need to use when you're looking for a job. So for, for better <laughs> or worse, uh, I've had one job uh, since I got out of fellowship, and I've never really had to make a make a CV on LinkedIn to uh, look for other jobs. Or it's so. it's it's grown a little bit, Alan. So okay. it's like it has become sort of a professional way of interaction, uh, just communicating about some of the really cool stuff that you're doing on Instagram. But LinkedIn's probably a, a little bit more professional. But again, you know. Do what you do. That's what I love about social media, right? It could be as much or as little as you want, but your brand is one of education. It's one of sharing. It's one of respect. Love when you're always out with the crew, with your fellows at a game or whatever, and and sharing that experience with them. And then that allows them to sort of grow as well. So kudos to you. Listen, Alan, this was great. You know, I have tremendous respect for you uh, as far as, you know, your drive, your desire, you know, to, to push the envelope, to educate, to be a mentor, to use social media, you know, to to educate our, our, our listeners and the people that are out there as well. And you're just doing great, great work. And it's just such a pleasure to have had you on the show today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Scott. Love talking to you. Love seeing you at all, all of our meetings and events. So uh, happy to uh, talk anytime. So we'll see you at OSET, I'm assuming. Going to see you in September in Boston? Uh, so, uh, I don't think I'm going to go to that one, but, but the one after that, for sure. All right. Sounds good. We'll be there for sure. What a great interaction. Really appreciate you, Alan. This is Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro, host of the Ortho Show. Till next time.